morning, folks. My name is Thad. This is Dimitri and Sagar. And today we're going to be talking about how we can augment communication with wearable computers. Now, Dimitri, my friend at Google, is deaf. And so you can imagine communicating with other Googlers is difficult. You know, so what he's going to sh show today is a system where he he's wearing a projector that listens to the audio around him and actually can caption what's being said and project it onto the chest of the person he's talking with. In addition, the system can listen to ambient audio, like dogs barking or cars coming up behind him or bicycle bells or whistling, and can display that as icons on, his, uh, on the screen so they can know basically what's going on around him. It also has a visualizer that Dimitri has learned to look at to actually kind of understand the ambient audio level in the room. And what we're going to show right now is a skit, uh, just a silly skit, that kind of shows all these features in one one-minute demo. So these guys are practicing for the new episode, uh, the new movie for Ace Ventura. So uh, here you go. Take it away, guys. <sighs> Sorry, I was sleeping. I'm Pep, department detective. His chest. What? A detective from the pet department? How may I help you? Our record shows that you bought a lot of dog food. Yes, uh, I did buy a lot of dog food. What is the issue there? We would like to examine your dog. Oh, uh, okay. Let me call him. Um, Let me try to find it. So, I have something to confess. Uh, the dog food is for me. I don't believe that you are a dog. What? You don't believe that my alter ego is a dog? Prove me this. All right. And that's what we call work at Google. <laughs> so um, one of the things that you might have noticed is that Dimitri has trouble controlling his voice. And when you're deaf, you don't have that feedback to know the ambient audio in the room, nor the intonation you're using. And so one of the things we're looking at is actually using the same system to help Dimitri modulate his voice and learn how to speak more in a more articulate man manner. If you want to learn more about this work, Come to our talk in the green tent at 1.30 today. Now, for the rest of my time, I like to talk about work I'm doing at Georgia Tech as a professor there. In particular, work I'm doing with Dr. Melody Jackson, my lab mate. So Melody is one of the world's experts on actually using brain-computer interfaces to help people who are locked in communicate. Now, these are people who have Lou Gehrig's disease. Their muscles, they lose control of their muscles progressively over time to the point where they have no voice, no eye control, uh, no control of their breathing or anything else. Now, the most famous person with ALS is Stephen Hawking. Now, fortunately for us, he still had control of his uh, eyes and his eyebrow, and that's one of the ways he actually was able to write the books he did. However, the people we work with have absolutely no muscle control. So we, so we need to actually use brain-computer interfaces to talk with them. The problem is that these interfaces are incredibly slow. A good interface is about a bit every two seconds, but about 80% accuracy. So one day, uh, my lab mate Melody and I started thinking about using sign language to communicate with people who are locked in. That seems completely unintuitive. How would we actually communicate with somebody who's paralyzed by using sign language? Well, it turns out that when somebody who has ALS tries to move, it activates the same region in the motor cortex as when you and I move normally. The signal just gets interrupted down in the brainstem. So if we could actually read the motion off the motor cortex, we could actually see them trying to, say, speak. But the problem is that the, the, the uh, parts of the body that are controlled by uh, the, the, the brain that does the lips, the tongue, and the pharynx is very small. We actually cannot scan that region of the brain at fine enough detail and fast enough to get out phonemes. However, sign language, the motion is much more exaggerated. For example, if I'm saying the word firehouse, 
involves the fingers, the hands, the elbows, the shoulders, and that's a large region on the motor cortex. You can see it here on the right. And so the hope is that we can actually see people trying to attempt sign language uh, as they are trying to communicate. Now, this is a simulation of what it should look like. We're looking at teaching people sign language before they get completely locked in and train up the system to their particular brain patterns. So in this case is the easiest stuff we can do. We're asking things like, are you hot or are you cold? Are you in pain or are you okay? Do you want to go to your chair or to your bed? These are one-handed versus two-handed signs. And so they should be the easiest ones we can actually recognize. So for our proof of concept, we're using functional, near sorry, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. And that involves a very big machine. But if this works, we, it, looks, it looks like we can actually get right off the surface of the brain using something called FNIR, functional near infrared imaging. And that just involves a skull cap like the one on the bottom here. So here's our results so far. This is my brain. Um, and what we're doing here is looking at the uh, red versus rest. So as you can see, bread indeed, uh, so this is bed, is indeed one-handed and it shows up on the left side of the brain. That's because the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. And chair, which is this, shows up on both sides of the brain. And so if we want to figure out if you want to go to your bed or to your chair, what we got to do is to see if the right side of the brain is, is lit up. And indeed, that works very well. We get about 93% accuracy using this system. Now remember, the average thing for brain-computer interfaces is 80% accuracy. Um, even better yet, we can look at actually doing entire phrases at a time. We can look at things like, the, the bed is hot, I'm in pain. And that looks at the flow of blood through the brain, the activation energy in the brain, over time, and recognizing the phrase as an entire system. And for that, we can actually get about 78% accuracy currently between 28 combinations of the phrases we're using. Now, communicating human to human is not the only possibility with wearable computers. We can also do things like communicate with dogs. Now, why would I want to do this? Well, a lot of dogs actually are working dogs. As a matter of fact, we call this project Facilitating Interactions for Dogs with Occupations, or FIDO for short. I wish I could claim that acronym, but that was actually my sign language linguist who did that. Um, the idea here is that I have a working dog, in this case, let's say a search and rescue dog. And a search and rescue dog works off leash. They go out, they try to find the missing child. And when they do, they actually have to run back and forth between the child and the rescuer, uh, uh, and it wastes a lot of time. So instead, let's put a GPS on the dog. And so we know where the dog is. But the thing is, the dog, is often trained not just for searching for live children, but also looking for cadavers as well. So what we really want to do in a case of, say, you know, a, a, a mass uh, emergency is have the dog be able to indicate that I find somebody who's alive or somebody who's dead so I know who to prioritize and where to send my rescue teams. And for doing this, we've actually made a wearable, wearable vest for the dog where if it finds a live person, it reaches over and bites this affordance with its mouth on the left side of its vest. If it finds somebody who is dead, it goes over and reaches on the right, uh, on the right side of the vest and pulls it. And this way, it geolocates the dog, indicates uh, if the person is alive or dead, and then we can send out the appropriate uh, team uh, for doing that. Now, the great part about this is it's not necessarily just for search and rescue. You can also use this for bomb sniffing dogs. Turns out the dogs can tell the difference between, say, C4 and dynamite. It can tell the difference between a peroxide bomb, which will blow up if you sneeze on it, versus something that's going to be stable even if you play with it like a football. And so having the dog be able to go out into an environment, search a, a big parking lot full of cars, or in Iraq or Afghanistan, a, a region, figure out if there's a bomb there, and then indicate which type of bomb it is, really can help our uh, soldiers and our police services know what types of service, uh, teams to bring. Finally, we've been looking at this for people who need assistance, uh, people who have, are blind or low vision. We have a student who actually one day came upon to a curb and needed to go forward and the dog refused to go. And he pulled out his cane and felt around and didn't feel anything. Thought the dog was just not paying attention, corrected it, and stepped forward right into wet cement. If the dog 
could have been able to say, no, there's something really here. We need to go around or wait a few minutes. It's, a, it's something that's going to move in a, in a second. It would have really changed his ability to interact with that dog. And so we're looking at ways to actually having these working dogs better communicate with their handlers. My name is Thad Stoner. We have another talk at 1.30. Thank you very much.